Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the HIV series um, of the KNHUN webinar. My name is Dr. Wangwe Kamau. I have Jerusha Malubi, who is a senior nursing officer in the Comprehensive Care Center. KNH has a wealth of experience in prep, in, ma in managing discordant couples. Um, KNH was a site for a study, Partners in Prevention. And after the study, um, the discordant, cu discordant Couples Clinic was established. And so, so Jerusha has been around since 2013. So she has a wealth of experience in PrEP and in managing discordant couples. So welcome to today's webinar. Uh, Jerusha, you're welcome to just share nuggets and the experiences that um, you have had. Um, so let's share our screen. So Karibu Sana Jerusha. Thank you very much, Dr. Kamau. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jerusha, as Dr. Kamau has already introduced me. Uh, I'm a senior nurse at KNHCCC. And welcome to our prep webinar. So we shall be doing this presentation. Um, me and Dr. Kamau uh, should be joining me uh, in a few slides. So to start with, we need to know what um, Sorry, I'm still getting the slides uh, correctly. So we are going to discuss PrEP and uh, we need to know, um, uh, there's a notion that many uh, health provide, healthcare providers don't know much about PrEP. So 90% um, uh, daily PrEP can reduce the risk of HIV, of acquiring HIV uh, by 90%. And then we have uh, daily PrEP can also reduce the risk of HIV infection among people who inject drugs by more than 70%. Um, one in three primary care doctors and nurses have heard about PrEP. I don't know about or an injection or uses vaginal uh, antiretroviral agents to prevent HIV infection. And who can check PrEP? Um, uh, in short, you're talking about indications for PrEP uh, according to the national guidelines. Uh, here in Kenya, we're using the NASCOP guidelines. So PrEP is recommended for HIV negative persons at a substantial ongoing risk of HIV infection, such as in cases of serodiscordant relationship, where the sexual partner is HIV positive and is not on ART, well, we would recommend that this person, the negative pass partner starts uh, on PrEP. And in cases whereby uh, the HIV partner is on ART for less than six months, uh, we recommend that the negative partner also is put on, on PrEP. And in cases of um, um, adherence suspect, poor adherence suspected uh, on the positive partner, we also need to put this partner who is negative on, on PrEP. Or uh, the positive partner has not achieved viral suppression, we need to also put the negative partner on, on PrEP. In cases of um, a couple trying to conceive, regardless of the viral load of the HIV positive partner, whether they are undetectable or not, we need to put uh, this negative partner on PrEP while they are trying to conceive. But, but in most cases, we wouldn't want to proceed with the preconception uh, process if uh, the positive partner actually has a detectable viral load. So what we do, we try and uh, prepare this couple and make sure that appearance is done to the positive partner so that uh, we achieve um, undetectable viral loads. Then we start the preconception sessions with the couple as we put the negative partner on, on PrEP for the purposes of conceiving. Other category of people who are eligible for, 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 for PrEP, we have, if you have a sexual, sexual partner or more than one sexual partner who we don't know their, their HIV status, and they, you think they are putting you at risk, so you need to be put on PrEP. 
anybody engaging in transactional sex, and by transactional sex, we mean anybody having sex uh, in exchange of any sort of a gift, this person could be at risk of getting HIV, so they qualify to be put on PrEP. Any person who has come with a recent um, sexually transmitted infection, you know, the, by getting a, an STI, it's the same way this person can get a, a HIV transmitted to them uh, because they didn't use protection. So this is a person who will qualify to be put on PrEP in case somebody presents to you with an STI. And anybody who has episodes or has come from uh, frequent uh, PEP or pro, uh, post exposure prophylaxis, this is a person we need to explore more. Uh, and then we can talk to them about uh, PrEP. Maybe they don't know about PrEP, so they keep coming uh, for PEP. These are people who are eligible to be put on PrEP. So if there's a history of sex whilst under the influence of alcohol or any recreational drugs as a habit, you know, with impaired judgment when someone is intoxicated uh, because of alcohol or any other substance, people tend to have impaired judgment so they may have sex uh, without any protection. So these are people who can actually benefit from PrEP. Consider to be at a high risk and they actually need to be to be put on PrEP. Then we have a category of people who inject drugs. Um, this is where there's use of injecting equipment that is shared. And we all know that when you share equipment, this there is usually uh, a risk of, of getting HIV infection. Then we also have um, special categories, men having sex with men. Uh, we know they are at very high risk and other key populations such as female sex workers, and uh, as I had mentioned earlier, people inject drugs. And we have a new kid on the block. Transgender has been put as a, a part of the key populations. This is also a, a population that is at a very high risk of getting uh, HIV infection. So anybody who comes to our facility and is requesting for PrEP and meets any of the above eligibility criteria is actually put on PrEP. So before we proceed, um, Dr. Kamoy is going to take us through some case scenarios, and then we can be able to see uh, what will happen next. Okay, thank you so much, Jerusha. These are uh, two case scenarios. One is of a partner who is um, at high risk of HIV infection by the name of Melly, who is 26 years old. And she comes to the family planning clinic for her three monthly uh, depot injection. And while she's there, she gets a HIV test and it is negative. She discloses to the nurse that she meets that her partner has multiple sexual partners. And in her own words, she says that he changes women like clothes. She's very happy about this negative result. Then the second case is by the name Ian, who comes into the clinic with his wife, Sandra. Sandra is pregnant with their first child. And tested positive for me and Ian would like to support her. So we'll come back to the case scenarios later uh, in, the, in the slides that are coming up next. Um, let us look at contraindications uh, for PrEP. So HIV, when one is HIV infected, actually we cannot start them on PrEP. That's one of the contraindications. If one does not want to know their HIV status, we would not proceed and start them on PrEP also. If they are unable to take the medication daily, remember this uh, daily pill uh, uh, for the oral daily pill. If we are unable to adhere, if, if we assess and you think they are unable to adhere, please don't start them on, on PrEP. Then we have suspected renal impairment as shown by creatinine clearance of less than 50 mils per minute. If you come across somebody who has a, a creatinine clearance of less than 50 mls per, per minute, you shouldn't start this person on PrEP or even if um, probably they have started and midway you find out that their creatinine is less than 50 mls per minute, you should stop the PrEP. We shall be seeing that in our in subsequent slides. So adolescents or the adults weighing less than 35 kilos or anybody below 15 years also, we don't put them on PrEP. I, I guess it's for the obvious reasons that you're using Genofavid for, for oral PrEP. So back to our case scenario. 
Okay, so remember Melly, who is 26, year, 26 years and has a partner who has multiple sexual partners. Well, she now, um, she now asks whether she qualifies for PrEP. So I don't know whether you can put it in the chat. chat. Do you think she qualifies for, uh, for PrEP? And if she's on PrEP, how long will she have to be on the PrEP? Then Melly asks the nurse who she needs, um, are there any side effects of the PrEP that she's being put on? So Ian's partner is uh, newly uh, diagnosed as living with HIV, and he wants to know whether he qualifies for PrEP and whether there are any contraindications. I'm sure from what Jerusha has uh, told us, you can think of contraindications. So are there any contraindications that, that Ian has? And he wants to know for how long he'll be on the PrEP. So we shall get back to the chats to see the responses. Meanwhile, let's continue. So initiating PrEP. PrEP is initiated only after a thorough behavioral and risk assessment to establish level of risk and willingness, stroke readiness to use PrEP. So a client may be eligible uh, maybe by behavior and then or lab-wise, but if the client is not ready to start PrEP, that one disqualify, disqualifies the client from starting PrEP. So above all other uh, indicators that may qualify the client, for as long as they are not ready to start PrEP, you cannot start PrEP. Then we have the clinical evaluation, including a physical exam. It's quite important that we do, we perform a, a full uh, clinical examination uh, just to find out how this client is. And um, also we have a laboratory evaluation to assess safety for, for use of PrEP. Um, but mostly the laboratory um, tests that you normally uh, conduct is, is we rely on, on creatinine test only. Uh, since the clients have to pay for these tests, so we want to keep the test as minimal as possible, but we are also trying as much as possible to follow the national guidelines, and we shall be seeing um, the tests that are required uh, in, in the, the subsequent uh, slides on how to do the laboratory evaluations according to the national guidelines. Clients also receive adequate adherence and ongoing risk reduction, so before you initiate this, this client on, on PrEP, just like the ART, you need to take them through the adherence uh, counseling uh, process. So you evaluate this client, any client uh, showing up with uh, signs of acute illness or acute HIV illness should not be commenced on PrEP. Let's wait for the signs of acute illness to go away, test this client and confirm that they are still HIV negative, then you can go ahead and initiate the PrEP after they have uh, recovered. So as we all know, PrEP is actually 90% um, effective. So let's look at uh, the recommended drugs. We have uh, the most preferred one, of course, is the oral daily PrEP. And uh, we are using TDF and FTC. TDF is 300 milligrams and FTC is 200 milligrams. It is being administered as a fixed dose, uh, as an FDC. We, in case that we don't, you don't have um, TDF and FTC in your center, you should not send away clients who have come for, for PrEP uh, services. So you could still go ahead and use uh, TDF and 3TC. TDF, we still maintaining, we maintain it at 300 milligrams and then uh, 3TC at 300 milligrams, also as an FDC. So let's not uh, get a, an excuse that we didn't have the Truvada, so we are not going to give PrEP services. So you could still use these drugs that we have already mentioned. Um, Event-driven oral PrEP, I'm sure this is new to many of us. Um, these days we have a, a PrEP that is being offered to individuals who probably are planning for sex uh, in the next uh, one or two days, and they are not on PrEP, uh, the, the daily PrEP. So um, it is appropriate, appropriate for all people assigned male at birth, not taking exogenous extradial based gender affirming hormones or transgender women and non-binary individuals assigned male at birth and not taking gender affirming hormones. So the preferred um, uh, dose is TDF, FTC, 300 milligrams and 200 milligrams as a fixed dose. It is taken two pills between two and 24 hours to the incident. And when I'm saying to the incident, I'm talking about the sexual, the planned sexual uh, incident uh, in advance or of anticipated sex. 
Then one pill is taken 24 hours after the first two pills. And one more pill is taken 48 hours after the, the first two pills. And that's it. We've completed the process of the incident-driven prep for that particular client at that particular time. Uh, alternative is still the same as the oral, the, the oral daily pill. We are giving an alternative of TDF, FTC, 300 milligrams and, and 300 milligrams as a fixed dose, but still the same sequence of 2-1-1. So um, the, the 2 one, one rule for PrEP uh, on demand, this is how it works. For example, on Wednesday, this person is planning to have sex. So they are given two pills, two to 24 hours before the sex. Then Thursday, you, you, you're supposed to be given another pill, which is one, one day, 24 hours, after, 24 hours after the first pill, the first two pills. Then on Friday, um, this is now two days or 48 hours after the first two pills. So we are giving the last pill. On Saturday, if there's no more sex, then of course we are not continuing with the, with the, uh, the incident-driven, uh, event-driven prep. But if they still feel they need to continue having sex after, after, after this, this Friday, then we need to talk this person and transition them to the oral daily prep. So they no longer need the event-driven prep, but now they qualify for the daily prep. So we revert to the daily prep and they check until um, they feel they are no longer at risk, but we still um, give, if it's a male person, definitely that's whom we are giving uh, the incident event-driven PrEP is a male pass partner. So we give the PrEP until two days after the last sexual contact. So we have other methods available, but we have not started using them um, um, in, our, in, in KNH. They are still in our guidelines. We have um, the pivoting, which is a vaginal ring. And the pivoting, uh, the pivoting ring is 25 milligrams inserted vaginally and is used for 28 days continuously without removing. It is if you want to continue preventing yourself, this is now specifically for women, they need to remove it after 28 days and replace it with a new one. Um, this is just um, information about uh, the, the pivoting ring. Okay, so this is um, woman initiated and it's self inserted monthly. And the good thing about it is it's discreet and does not interfere with sex. So there's slow release of the pivoting. And this is actually what helps with um, HIV prevention. So studies, in, studies have shown that there's um, 35% reduction um, in HIV risk. And, and uh, this, and in the ring study and in the aspire study those are 27 percent a reduction in the risk of hiv um, transmission so the good thing about the ring is that there is increased um ad adherence and with the increased adherence it suggests that there'll be greater risk reduction and this is one of the first long acting hiv pre prevention products that was developed so we have the fourth uh, method uh, for prevention of hiv and we, it is an injection, it's called cabotegravir. It's usually administered 600 milligrams IM. Then it's repeated one month uh, after the initial dose. And thereafter, you ask this client to be coming every two months until their risk goes down, then you can stop uh, the cabotegravir. However, as we had said, this one, we have not started using it in KNH. We are hoping it will get to us one of these fine days. It's also a long acting, um, uh, prep method. Yeah, so in terms of the effectiveness of carbotegravir, so it's been studied in both cisgender men and also cisgender women. So when they looked at it, the early, early trial data showed that um, the incidence rates of HIV in the patients that are receiving um, daily um, TDF and FTC was 1.22%. And if you compare with the patients who are receiving long acting uh, the injectable carbotegravir, the incidence rates was 0.41%, showing that it was really effective. So later on, as, as, as they completed the study, it came to 1.21% uh, for TDF and FTC and 0.38% for the long-acting in injectable carbotegravir. And this is the in the 
HPTN083, which was one of the first studies that investigated carbotegravir for HIV prevention. So in terms of in, in, in cisgender women, and this was a study that was done in South Africa, and this was looking at the, the effectiveness of long-acting injectable carbotegravir and its effectiveness in preventing HIV infection in cisgender women. And this is now the HPTN084. Remember, the other one was 083. And what the conclusions are, because they're comparing uh, women who are on oral PrEP and women who are injectable on injectable PrEP. So they compared oral TDF FTC and women who are put on carbotegravir. And what they found is both agents were actually highly effective in preventing HIV, but carbotegravir was superior to daily uh, TDF FTC in pre pre preventing HIV in cisgender women. And it was actually noted to have 89%. It was actually noted to lower the risk of HIV infection by 89%. Remember with the ring we are talking about 30% and 27%. And they showed that um, eight weekly uh, carbotegravir was likely um, provided an adherence advantage over daily oral TDF FTC. So there's actually ongoing testing to fully understand why there are some people who had the breakthrough infections. So both products were safe and well tolerated. Uh, with few differences in grade two adverse events uh, by arm. So, so apart from injection site reactions, which were generally mild associated with pain and occurred at the first injection, but there were no discontinuations due to injection site reactions. So this, this data actually complemented what we've just prevent, presented in the previous slide. So just as it is uh, uh, effective in men, it's also, a safe and effective in injectable. I mean, it's also safe and, and effective in cisgender women. So one of the things that has been shown with this uh, long acting agents is that if, if there is a breakthrough HIV infection, sometimes the long acting agent actually uh, suppresses the virus. So it would be hard for you to tell if somebody is HIV infected. And it's something that they are describing as LEVI, abbreviated as L-E-V-I, LEVI, so this is long-acting um, early viral inhibition. Uh, so if you were to seroconvert, it would be hard. But this has been found in very few cases. So what is effective prep use? Um, um, these are the steps <coughs> of assessing effective prep use. Uh, prep should be offered as part of comprehensive individualized prevention plan following behavioral risk assessment and adherence counseling. And then there's a combination of many things uh, that many uh, preventive uh, therapies. So we look at risk reduction counseling. This is done um, uh, every visit a client comes and we actually um, do risk reduction counseling in every session so that the clients can actually uh, try and get back to safer sex practices. Then you have prevention of uh, stroke treatment to STIs. Uh, apart from PrEP, we are still talking of other preventive measures. We know that um, if we prevent STIs, um, we are likely we are also also preventing uh, 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 transmission or acquisition of HIV. So we have other modes of, of prevention. Um, uh, we have a VMMC that is male, male voluntary male medical uh, circumcision, whereby when we come across a client who has, who's probably uh, testing negative, and um, we have uh, tools that enable us to assess clients who are at risk. And VMMC being one of them, we actually um, um, engage these clients and ask if there's a tool that is asking, uh, there's a question whereby we ask a client if they are circumcised. So if they are not circumcised, we inform them and educate them on the importance of circumcision. And then we are able to refer them so that they can access the voluntary male circumcision um, services. We also um, emphasize on consistent and correct condom use as a package um, of prevention. And then we have substance abuse treatment um, and then uh, prevention of GBV. Uh, our colleague was here on this forum last week talking much about GBV. So GBV and HIV, they are inseparable. So we are assessing GBV at all, at all avenues. And then even when you are giving PrEP, there are people who want to prevent themselves from 
getting the HIV and probably the uh, uh, a sexual relationship where there's sexual abuse. So we are also going to assess uh, and support uh, clients going through GBV. Adherence is paramount, as I had said earlier, for clients who are already on, on PrEP. And efficacy is purely dependent on adherence. Um, effective ART on the other side, um, uh, for persons who are HIV positive, is also a way of preventing HIV transmission. So what happens during PrEP follow-up? After starting oral PrEP, clients are followed up regularly. Uh, when they come the first time and they're tested and they're eligible for, H for PrEP initiation, we call it the initial visit. At the initial visit, we are testing them and uh, confirming that they're HIV negative. We are doing risk uh, assessment. Uh, there's a tool that we'll see how it looks like, uh, a tool that we use for assessing risk. Um, we are assessing for risk and once they qualify even behaviorally um, and uh, you, you, you start them on PrEP, you ask them to come after one month. So when they come at one month, we call it month one visit. And at one month one visit, we are also retesting. This is very helpful because you may have initiated this client on PrEP while they were seroconverting and then just turned negative at that particular time. So if they were seroconverting at the initial visit, you're going to capture the seroconversion at month one. That's why uh, testing at month one is very important. So when they test and the test is still negative, you go ahead and assess, are they still at risk? So it's not automatic that they've come from month one and now we are going to give them a refill for the next two months. So we are still going to do an, a risk assessment and find out that if they're still uh, at risk, so we continue and, and, and see them at month three. So we, from here, we'll be seeing them every three months and be testing them every three months as indicated here. Then, um, as I had said, the test is done every three months and the continuous risk reduction counseling is also emphasized. Adherence and assessment for support. So some people also need to be supported to be on this prep uh, or going through the journey of, of HIV prevention. Uh, every visit we also assess for side effects so that we see if the clients are going through any side effects. We have um, extreme side effects that we may, they may disqualify this client from continuing with PrEP. And then we have the normal side effects that uh, the, the client is allowed to continue with, with, with their PrEP. So we will obtain creatinine results as per the guidelines. We'll be looking at that uh, as we proceed. So is there a duration for PrEP, uh, for taking PrEP? Uh, I would say yes and no. A PrEP is not meant to be a long life intervention like the ART. It is a method of HIV prevention during the period when one is at a great risk of, and it's an ongoing risk actually of acquiring HIV. So when one's risk has gone down, this PrEP should be stopped. Any client who has not taken PrEP for more than seven days, if for example, a client was put on PrEP, um, came for their, their PrEP a refill three months ago, and you realize that um, for more than seven days, they've come for their, maybe they are late for their, for their clinic schedule visit, and they have not taken PrEP for more than seven days, you actually restart these clients on PrEP. So we call it a, a restart visit. They're going to start all over again, and then um, they will be asked um, to use protection within, if it's a female, they will be asked to either abstain for seven days or use uh, protection during the seven days until they attain the, the, the level of, of drugs again in their bloodstream. So now you consider them safe again after seven days, but tell them they need to continue on the daily pill, even after the seven days. Some clients think after the seven days they can stop their PrEP, that is not the case. So they need to be properly educated when they are starting their PrEP. Also, we need to educate these clients that they don't stop the prep uh, at home. They decide now, I think uh, my risk has gone down and um, I'm going to stop my prep in the house. So we ask them to come back to the clinic once they feel their risk has, has gone down. And we do a test again when they are coming off the prep. Um, we want to make sure that this client has actually stopped prep while they are still um, HIV negative and it's documented. And uh, and these days, for we have been giving um, prep for 28 days after the last exposure, but uh, these days we are giving uh, seven days, as we shall be seeing again. Uh, when we are stopping prep, what do we do? So for event-driven prep, uh, it should be taken. It should not be taken more than two times in a week, as we had explained earlier. If this is a client who wants to take uh, the event-driven prep more than two times, please. Um, 
revert these patients and put them on the daily oral prep. Points to note, prep is safe in pregnancy, so do not be afraid to put your clients on prep while, while they are pregnant and even during breastfeeding. So we find that many women seroconvert when they are pregnant or even breastfeeding. So we actually say uh, women should actually be put on prep when they are, uh, they are pregnant uh, and even breastfeeding so that we prevent them from seroconverting during breastfeeding and pregnancy. PrEP does not prevent unwanted pregnancy. So what do we do? We go back to family planning. So as we are assessing and give counseling for PrEP, we also need to counsel for, uh, for prevention of STIs. We also need to counsel for uh, prevention of unplanned pregnancies. And we introduce uh, the various types of family methods, uh, family planning methods that we have at the clinic so that the female clients can take the PrEP alongside the family planning method if they are not ready for a pregnancy. And, um, and since PrEP does not prevent STIs, we still encourage people to use PrEP uh, and, and combine with, with condoms. So we have come back to our case scenario. Uh, okay, so back to the scenario. I've just gone to the chat and people were, some people were saying um, both of them qualify for PrEP. Some people were saying only Ian. Uh, some people were saying Melly and Melly should take it for 28 days. So Jerusha, do they both qualify for PrEP? I think both of them qualify for PrEP. Um, um, and how long should, should, they, uh, should they take it for? So for Ian, um, whose, wife, whose wife is uh, living with HIV? Whose wife is living with HIV? Ian was just starting. ART. We have one. We will go back to the, my previous slides. We said um, if you have a you're in a discordant relationship and you have a positive partner, once your positive partner is virally suppressed, you can stop the prep. So once uh, Ian's wife uh, achieves a, a maximum viral suppression, we can stop uh, the prep uh, for Ian. Okay, Melly, Melly, Melly's uh, partner has multiple sexual partners. So how long will she take the prep for? So Melly's partner who has multiple sexual partners, she is going to be on PrEP as we continue counseling the partner on risk reduction. So we will not tire, uh, we will ask them to be, to, be, to be coming together to the clinic so that we continue with the risk reduction plan and also offer condoms and educate Melly's partner that um, even though he has Melly as the, the, the primary partner, he should be using protection while he's having sex with other, with other partners outside the relationship. Okay, so when he desires to get pregnant, what advice would you give her? Is, is PrEP safe? As I have said earlier on, PrEP is safe in pregnancy. And yes, PrEP is safe. So um, what will happen is that um, we will look at her viral load. We don't want her to conceive when her viral load is, is high. We know the risk of so when the... Meli is, is, is not living with HIV. So it's the, it's, she doesn't know the husband's, the partner's status. So, okay, in this case, we want um, her to continue with uh, PrEP is, is safe in pregnancy. We'll ask her to continue uh, as we continue counseling the, the male partner for, and doing risk reduction uh, at every visit counseling. Okay, so this is a question I get uh, several times. Eh? So Melly's partner is the one who is at risk of HIV infection. So Melly conceives, delivers a baby. Do we, would we need to do a DNA PCR on Melly's baby and Melly is, is, is HIV negative? In this case, we are talking of prevention of mother to child. So Melly uh, is HIV negative. There is no need of doing a PCR to the baby because already she can't transmit uh, the virus if she's, she's negative. So there's no need of taking the baby through PCR. Yeah, that, I get that question a lot. Now let's go to Ian. Ian's wife, Sandra, is now virally suppressed and she's adjusted well to taking her treatment. She's adherent on treatment. Should he continue PrEP? Um, it's a bit tricky here um, 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 because uh, Sandra is virally suppressed and um, we have Ian who is a negative partner. Ideally, we should be stopping the PrEP but we need to find out if Ian has other sexual partners. If Ian has other sexual partners, which may not uh, come out clearly in a session where both of them are in. So you may need to, to separate uh, Sandra and Ian and find out if Ian has other, other clients. I'm going to give you um, 
a real scenario that happened uh, uh, just like Ian and Sandra. We had in 2020, we have a couple in 2021 where the male partner was the negative one and then the female partner was on ART and then uh, we started the male partner on, on PrEP. So as soon as the female partner was virally suppressed, we brought them uh, the couple together in a counseling session and we informed them that um, this male partner could stop their PrEP. So we asked Are you, the, the male partner if he's comfortable stopping the PrEP, he said, yes, my wife is virally suppressed. So they went, we tested the negative partner, he was, he was negative. So since the, their wife is suppressed, we stopped the prep. And um, six months down the line, the male partner came back. He was not due uh, to be seen at that particular time, but he came back with uh, symptoms uh, of diarrhea, signs and symptoms of diarrhea. And uh, we decided why don't we do a test first? So we did a test. Uh, unfortunately, the test came out positive. Uh, determined, the determined test was, was positive and then the first response, it was a contradictory result. So the first response showed a negative uh, test. So what do we do in this case? We do a PCR according to the national guidelines. So we took a, a DBS, blood sample on a, DB, on a DBS and it was sent to the national lab laboratory. Apparently we didn't get the results and uh, we were asked to do another, to call the client back. So two months down the line, the client was called and came. So we decided we are not going to do a DBS. Why don't we just run the, the rapid test first? So we ran the rapid test again. The determine was positive and the first response was positive. So at this point, there is no need of doing a, a DBS for PCR. So we declared this, uh, this person, this man, um, this negative partner who is a man positive. And since this time he hadn't come with the wife, we sat down and wanted to know if um, he has been using protection or what may have happened. And uh, he actually told us um, he has been having other partners other than the, the stable partner who, uh, who is virally suppressed. He actually has other partners and he has not been using protection with other partners because he couldn't carry condoms to the house. Um, he didn't feel like he wanted to carry condoms to the, to the house to have sex with other partners. So here we are. The negative person who we have been following up while he was on PrEP was negative. He stopped PrEP and he contracted the virus probably from a different partner. So he was so afraid and he asked us not to tell uh, the, the partner that um, uh, he got it from. Okay, he asked us to convince the partner to just accept him, uh, knowing very well he didn't get the virus from the partner. So in short, what am I saying? that like in Ian's case, yes, the wife is, is virally suppressed, but you should find out does Ian have other partners uh, other than the Sandra who is virally suppressed. If he does have other partners and he doesn't know their statuses, he needs to continue with PrEP. Thank you so much, Jerusha. So how do we assess for, for, for risk uh, when we are seeing a negative client? Ideally, any, any negative client showing up in a VCT uh, uh, center um, should be assessed uh, for risk using the RAST tool. And this RAST tool has been, it's a national tool that has been approved by NASCOP. So it's a standardized tool uh, for the RAST. So you can all see R stands for the risk, the A stands for the assessment, the S stands for the screening, and then the T for the tool. So we assess for risk using a standardized assessment tool and currently available electronically in our EMR system here at KNH. And also the HTS counselors, they also have the, the RAST tools. Uh, in, uh, they're also using uh, uh, an electronic uh, version of the RAST tool also in their, in their EMR systems. So this is what we ask when we are assessing for, for risk, uh, for when you come across a negative client. So the risk is assessed um, uh, within the past six months. So we ask, in the past six months, have you had sex with more than one partner? Uh, in the past six months, have you had sex without a condom? Uh, in the past six months, have you had sex with anyone whose HIV status you do not know? Are any of your partners at risk of HIV infection? Do you have sex with a partner who has HIV? Have you been recently diagnosed with an STI? Do you desire uh, 
pregnancy. Um, have you injected drugs that were not prescribed by a healthcare provider? If yes, did you use syringes, needles, or drug preparation equipment that had already been used by other persons? Have you received money, housing, food, or gifts in exchange for sex? Remember, we talked about transactional sex, and this here, this is where we are. Have you been forced to have sex against your will? You remember my colleague's presentation last week, she was talking about SGBV. This is now where SGBV comes in. Um, and we are assessing for if people who are going through uh, SGBV are actually people need to prevent from uh, getting HIV infection. Have you been physically assaulted, including assault by a sexual partner? So we are still continuing uh, with a GBV assessment at this particular point. So when you're screening for discordant couples, these are the questions we ask. Is your partner taking ARVs? Remember we had said if they're not on ARVs, uh, the negative partner is eligible. Has your partner been on ART for more than six months? And if uh, here we are want to see uh, if they have been on ART for more than six months, we want to find out are, are their partners virally suppressed. If not, then of course these people are eligible, these negative persons are eligible for PrEP. At least once a month, do you discuss whether your partner is taking their drugs? So remember we had said if uh, we have an, an adherent partner in a discordant relationship, the negative partner should be put on PrEP. So this is why we are initiating a dialogue between the negative and the positive partner regarding their viral load, the viral load of the positive partner. If you know, when was your partner's last HIV viral load test done and what was the result? So the negative partner, need, they need to know their partner's results. In our case, we have a discordant clinic here in, 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 in the KNHCCC. So we do not have problems um, reviewing or following up on the positive partner's viral load uh, because we have a discordant couple clinic where we follow both of them, the negative and the positive partner. Do you desire pregnancy with your partner? So um, if in a discordant relationship, we had said regardless of, of, of their viral load uh, status, uh, the negative partner needs to be put on PrEP when they desire to conceive. Do you use condoms every time you have sex? This is a, another question that we ask. So we are now coming to, um, we are looking at now the continuation of PrEP. So when do we discontinue PrEP? PrEP should be discontinued if one zero converts, that is if they turn out to be HIV positive, we discontinue PrEP. And if there's a change in risk from high to low risk, we discontinue this, uh, the, the, the PrEP. And uh, renal adverse effects, and I, remember I told you the main uh, test that we conduct is creatinine. And uh, if the client has been on PrEP and we are doing a creatinine and the clearance is uh, less than 50 ml per minute, we should discontinue PrEP. Then if we have sustained an adherence, remember we said uh, adherence is paramount also in PrEP just like in ART. So if we have instances of an adherence to PrEP, uh, we should actually consider stopping PrEP uh, for this person who is an adherent and discuss other ways of, of prevention. Then uh, if uh, there is sustained viral suppression for the HIV positive partner in a discordant relationship, we can stop PrEP, but please consider if the other external uh, partners that may not be known by the partner, the negative part, the, the positive partner. If a client comes and uh, requests to stop PrEP, we will actually stop PrEP, test them and make sure they're actually stopping PrEP and they're still HIV negative. Um, when discontinuing PrEP, we have been giving for 28 more days, but it has been revised these days, you give uh, seven more days from the last day of exposure. So how do we uh, monitor uh, the, the clients who are on PrEP or starting PrEP? So the first laboratory test is uh, the HIV rapid test. And this is usually is done before initiating PrEP as, uh, as per the national guide, HTS uh, guidelines. And then it is repeated every three months and, and uh, after every three, at, at month one and every three months, whilst the client is on PrEP. We have creatinine test. Uh, you, we are required to test one to three months uh, of initiation, PrEP initiation. And for people who are more than 50 years, uh, we actually required to screen for creatinine every six to 12 months. And then clients of any age with renal comorbidity, 
you should test uh, for creatinine before initiating PrEP. These are the people you can actually start PrEP uh, without a, a creatinine test. It can be done later on, but strictly for clients with uh, renal issues, we do not start PrEP before you do the creatinine test. Um, and then after that, you can follow them up every six months uh, with the creatinine test. We have a test, uh, hepatitis B surface antigen uh, serology that is needed to be done uh, within the three months of initiation, uh, if uh, initiating PrEP. If negative, if uh, the test is negative, we need to refer this client for hepatitis uh, vaccine. Then we have hepatitis C, uh, whereby a serology test whereby it, it is done within three, it should be done within three months uh, of PrEP initiation, then every three months for persons at a high risk of hepatitis C. Um, however, um, we have challenges running these tests because uh, they are not supported uh, by any program, um, starting from the creatinine test. So clients are required to foot the, the bills uh, when they are sent for these tests. And many of them may not even be able to afford the creatinine test, leave alone the hepatitis and the hepat B and the hepatitis C tests. So it will depend on your facility. Um, for us, we actually send them um, uh, at the University of Nairobi and KNH also, uh, the place of their choice so that uh, we are able to follow them with the creatinine tests. We are hoping that one day uh, somebody will come and support the tests. So you find many clients have tests that have been have not been done. They have skipped many tests because they, are, they may not be able to afford the tests. So what will happen in case of a sort of conversion? So in case of a sort of conversion, we stop prep immediately. Uh, the, 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 the patient is client, the client is, is cancelled on the positive results and what it means. And then you take a DBS or plasma for DST in the same day. Then uh, you link the client to care. For us, we, they are just linked within here the CCC in case there is a cell conversion. And uh, now you follow the processes whereby um, what we normally do for the HIV positive uh, clients, initial clients, assess for barriers for, for ART, assess for support for ART and the uh, treatment body and so on and adherence uh, issues. Then uh, the seroconversion is documented. Uh, you inform your DASCO, your PASCO, um, and then you fill in the correct forms to document the seroconversion. This is that we are documenting this seroconversion if it is it all occurs while the client is still on prep. So, so let's go back to Melly and Ian. So Melly had a good pregnancy and delivered a bouncing baby boy weighing 3.5 kgs. She's still um, HIV negative. So what happened while on PrEP two years after delivering, um, right about the time when she stopped breastfeeding, uh, she developed deranged UECs and had a creatine clearance of 40. So less than 50, we needed to stop um, oral PrEP. So for Ian, I think Jerusha really gave the story out. Five months after, after stopping the PrEP, came back with the diarrhea and was positive, and she already gave us the reasons why he seroconverted. So one of the questions that have been, has been asked in the chat is what seroconversion is. Uh, thank you for asking that question. Seroconversion is um, um, a non-HIV negative who is now turning HIV positive. So they are converting from negative status to HIV positive status. We call that a zero conversion. Thank you, Jerusha. Okay, in real life, I'll just tell you about Meli. Meli was not actually um, HIV negative, but I was listening to one of our clients in the CCC who came in with such a history. And while, while she was, um, so she came in with her four year old child and the whole family tested positive uh, for HIV. And so now they are living with HIV. But going deep down into her history, um, there was a missed opportunity for us as healthcare workers. When Melly went for her family planning, she was um, seronegative. While she delivered her now four-year-old child, she was seronegative. 
um, during ANC, she was seronegative. So I think there was a missed opportunity for PrEP there during the family planning visit, or even during the times when uh, Melly came to the health facility and probably was offered um, uh, a HIV test. So I, 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 we wanted to bring this uh, to bring this case in the reverse, so that we can we can make sure that even while we are testing um, people and not to much as they turn negative, let's also now evaluate the risks as Jerusha has um, has has trained us today, so that we don't miss those opportunities for prep. So I think I'll ask um, Jerusha because she's been here. So tell us a bit about the Partners in Prevention Study, you know, what came out of it and why there was the need to continue the DCC clinic. So the Partners in Prevention Study um, was a multinational study, which was being funded, uh, by, uh, which was being funded by the University of Washington in collaboration with the University of Nairobi. So it had four sites. Uh, this is the study that informed us of the use of oral PrEP uh, that is actually being used right now all over the world. So in Kenya, we had four sites. Uh, we had a site in, in Thika. Uh, we had uh, the Nairobi site um, here uh, at the Couple Counseling Center for those who are in Kenyatta. It was at the Couple Counseling Center next to the Patient Support Center. And then we had a site in Eldoret and then um, a site in Kisum. So we had other sites in, 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 in Uganda and, and also um, I think in Tanzania or something like that. So um, in 2008, the PrEP Partners PrEP study was started. And then um, uh, in 2012, it was uh, declared that uh, PrEP is actually effect, uh, it has, has been proven to be effective in preventing HIV. So in 2013, PrEP uh, uh, was uh, actually uh, uh, launched here by NASCOP uh, in, in our country. And since we had so many, we had uh, more than 400 couples who had enrolled in the PrEP study. And the, when the study ended, so they asked, what next? Uh, what are we supposed to do with our negative uh, partners? And uh, you can't just be sending us to the CCC and then we leave our negative partners, yet we have been journeying together as couples. So the EI, uh, whom I must mention, was Professor Kiaria. I know most of you know Professor Kiaria. Uh, he's, he went to work with the WHO um, in Geneva. Uh, so the PI decided now, uh, I think uh, we can start something uh, with the clients who actually participated in the PrEP study at the Nairobi site. And that's when he decided to start a discordant couple clinic, which is uh, popularly known as the DCC. So we started the DCC and uh, recalled back the clients who were willing to come back and, uh, and start care. So instead of sending the positive clients um, to the CCC, we decided we are going to start a care for, as a couple, a package for couples. And then and, uh, within that, the discordant couple clinic, we had several uh, activities. We actually, we were following up the positive partner like any other ART partner. And we were following up the negative partner with preventive measures, the ones we have discussed. And within that center, we also decided they wanted to conceive. How do we conceive when we're in a discordant relationship? So we came up with another uh, project within the DCC uh, center that was known as a uh, safer conception uh, uh, pro program. So in the safer conception back then in 2013, we didn't have viral loads. So uh, when a couple wanted to conceive, you would not do a viral load, you just do a CD4 cell count. And then we had several methods of conception. Uh, if the negative partner was a male, it was easier. Uh, we would do a home vaginal insemination, uh, what we called HBI. A home vaginal insemination is whereby we, we would give special condoms, non-spermicidal condoms uh, to the couple. They would go have sex. Then we, we take a syringe um, and obtain the, the semen from the, con the non-spermicidal condom. And the male partner would help inject the, this, the, the semen into the lady. Uh, as she lies down, we encourage the lady after the um, insemination that she should not come down the bed and she should just stay in the bed for some hours. That one worked uh, if the partner, the male partner was negative. If the male partner was the positive partner, we would do um, a sperm wash. Uh, since we didn't have the viral load back then, we would make, try and make sure at least you're minimizing the viral load um, 
in, in the semen. So we would send them at the Nairobi uh, University of Nairobi, um, Gaini Lab, and uh, they would be given an appointment as a couple, and then the semen would be ob obtained in a special room. Uh, and then it went through sperm wash before it was inseminated into the neck, into the, uh, to the lady. Uh, these days, uh, things have changed. We have PrEP, so PrEP has made things much easier. We no longer need to do um, the vaginal, home vaginal insemination or um, the sperm wash. So with the use of ART, we're actually very safe because we make sure the person who is um, on ART is virally suppressed, first is virally suppressed and with the availability of viral load testing, this is possible. And then the negative person is on PrEP, so it has made things easier. And so we, uh, from 2013 to 2019, uh, the DCC was merged with the CCC. So uh, when it was merged, we are still taking care of discordant couples. Uh, right now, as we speak, we have uh, more than 1,189 uh, discordant couples enrolled uh, at the CCC. So some of them are on PrEP, some of them are not. Some have come for PrEP. Uh, we have couples that have had more than four children under PrEP. And we have couples that are still uh, ongoing uh, in the process of conception. And I would say that is a big achievement for us uh, at the CCC. Um, so apart from discordant couples, we still have the general population that we still offer um, the PrEP. Uh, anybody coming in as an individual and we feel they are at risk, they are put on, on PrEP at the CCC. As you know, KNH is vast, it's big, uh, we have challenges. So we have challenges of clients probably coming at the a &E department uh, and the CCC is actually towards the end of, of the, the KNH compound, uh, um, very far away from the, from the a &E. and uh, And we would want to decentralize the services so that we capture the people coming for, who are at risk of the a &E and other departments. So we are still working on that. And uh, we hope that one day we'll be able to decentralize our, our services for PrEP. And another challenge is that um, clients coming here at the CCC to, to, to check their PrEP, they feel stigmatized because they feel CCC is a place for people who are HIV positive. So anybody seeing me at the CCC, they wouldn't know that I'm coming for PrEP and they feel um, they're not comfortable. Uh, so it's sort of, that's one challenge we are trying to overcome. We are trying to look for, a, we actually have a secluded place. We have a gazebo here in the CCC whereby we see our children, uh, the children who are in care, they normally sit there as they wait, as, as they're waiting way. So we are trying our level best to be able to give them a private place where they can be able to sit and wait uh, as they wait for their turn to be seen. And then we have um, our PMTCT department is just um, near the a &E. So we, that's our first decentralization point. We decided to start prep at the PMTCT center and the nurses and the clinic, clinicians uh, have been trained on prep. So they are offering PrEP to the clients who come for uh, PMTCT services at the PMTCT level. And we have a youth center that, um, a youth center in KNH, but actually most of our clients are at risk. We have these men having sex with men and, and, and they, they actually show up a lot at the youth center. And then I must say they're doing a good job because they're actually capturing the youth. And uh, those ones have to be brought all the way to the CCC. We hope that when we decentralize our services, they'll also be able to be, to be seen uh, at, at close proximity, uh, not far away from where they are being tested from. And um, currently we have people, we have 419 people who are on PrEP follow-up. Remember we said PrEP is not a lifelong. So people start PrEP and they stop. We have many that we stop every time they come for their visit. And then... Um, so, of 950 of them are in a discordant relationship. We have never had somebody who's zero converted while on prep. Uh, that's, I think, something I am proud of. Well, that's a great achievement. And you know, just to put it in perspective, there are 19 service delivery points in Kenyatta National Hospital that offer um, HIV testing services. So, for those who don't turn positive, and I think we have a positivity rate of two to three percent in the whole hospital so it means that 19 percent 
um, of these people are actually um, HIV negative, meaning there's an opportunity for interventions for them to remain HIV negative. And the PMTCT clinic is housed in Clinic 66. So those women who are coming to bring their babies for vaccination or those women who are coming for family planning have an opportunity to be offered PrEP. So um, as we offer PrEP services, remember documentation is very, very important. It did not happen if it was not documented. And we are actually using national uh, documents uh, approved by NASCOP and provided by NASCOP. So we have uh, two registers. We have MOH 266, which is a PrEP register. And then we have MOH 267, which is a PrEP daily activity register. Uh, there is one that is actually for PrEP summary. It's a, it's a summary uh, reporting tool that is known as uh, MOH 731. And now the last tool that I had spoken about. So this is how we document uh, PrEP and PrEP activities. And I have come to the end of the presentation. Yeah, so thank you so much, Jerusha. I mean, that has been an excellent um, uh, presentation. So I will go to some of the questions. I've, I think I've been um, answering some. So someone asks, can TDF alone be used as PrEP for heterosexual men and women? Alone um, without FTC or um, TTC? We have, okay, we are not, uh, in our country, I must say that we have people who live in really, really remote areas. So if you are having, you are living in those remote areas and you don't, you not, don't have access to TDF, FTC, we don't have access to TDF, uh, TTC, you can still give TDF alone. Uh, it is better than nothing actually. So you can still give TDF alone and make sure you're giving it correctly and do adherence as well. Although it is not uh, the first um, option, it's as a last resort that is. Okay. Someone asks, does taking a shower after unprotected sex reduce the chances of contracting HIV? Well, I don't think this is correct. Uh, taking a shower does not, uh, prevent someone from, from contracting HIV. So it is a practice that you should not encourage anybody. Yeah. Someone asks about oral carbotegravir. So it has not been studied for PrEP. It's only the injectable carbotegravir that has been studied for PrEP. So we don't use it in this case. So Rukia Aksam asks a very excellent and pertinent question, and I'm sure you experienced it, Jerusha. How does a healthcare worker following, follow up with clients with limited or uh, stockouts of HIV testing kits? Not sure if the commodity issue has stabilized at national levels. So when there was a stockout, what, how are you managing your patients? Well, when the, there's a stockout, um, one, if we can't access determine we were giving um, the, the, if you have an, or the oral testing kit, you could use that one uh, when there are no stockouts. But we, we, when you had stockouts, we did not stop uh, giving PrEP. Remember, you could stop the PrEP and put this person at risk. So we were, and since the stockouts were not lasting long, uh, we were still proceeding with, with the PrEP. But we would uh, constantly call these clients and do adherence counseling uh, uh, when we, they had not tested for PrEP. And when the, the tests came, we called them even before their, their, their appointment time to now be able to do the test. So somebody is asking whether there's anything new in terms of post-exposure um, prophylaxis. So what about medical personnel, needle prick or surgeon? Do we use, so we use post-exposure prophylaxis. So it's uh, TDF, UTC, BTG. Um, ABC for adults, and then for those who weigh, uh, for children who weigh less than um, 35 kgs, we're giving ABC, 3TC, and DTG. So we're using um, DTG-based regimens for uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. So, so somebody asks about what I mentioned about Levy. So with the viral inhibition, how will you make a diagnosis of HIV? So this is something new. It's a new phenomenon that's being studied, um, but eventually, um, when they stop the PrEP, you'll be able to diagnose them. Remember, I said that PrEP is not lifelong. It's only when they are undergoing the risk. But it's something that is new and being, being studied um, uh, more. So in terms of other questions, I'm just going down. 
So does this a question, someone asked a question, does PrEP have any effect on HPV, papilloma virus? Um, uh, PrEP does not have any connection with HPV, so HPV should just be followed on its own. Yeah, but probably if you have to say HBV, so yeah, PrEP, TDF, 3TC are used in the treatment of hepatitis B. Mm. So are women not eligible for the event-driven PrEP? So, I mean, women are not eligible for the event-driven PrEP, and this is because it takes seven days for their for the drug levels. Estrogen has effects on TDF and 3TC. So, um, so it would take about seven days for the levels to actually be uh, be uh, drug levels to to reach a level that it can actually prevent um, HIV. But men, men or transgender women, um, so these are those who are assigned male at birth, do not have those high estrogen levels that would inhibit the levels of uh, TDF and TDF that would prevent. So they, so men can actually, um, uh, men can actually use the event-driven prep. So somebody else asked, like, how how soon would 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 someone be safe in quotes um, for an event, for a sexual event, if they're on prep? So for men, between two to twenty four hours, but for women, it would be seven days. So I think that answers that question. Um, so at what point do we stop PrEP for a partner who is virally suppressed, having in mind that viral suppress, suppression sometimes means that they experience bleeps, any risks? So I mean, there's continuous uh, viral uh, monitoring for the HIV, for the person living with HIV. And yes, it's true, those bleeps can actually prevent, um, those bleeps can actually um, increase the risks of transmission. But the good thing is the data that we had from the Partners in Prevention study um, PrEP was very effective in this. But once they stop uh, taking the PrEP, we hope that with the continuous viral monitoring, we'll be able to pick up the bleeps. Um, kindly elaborate on undetectable is untransmissible, U equals U with regards to PrEP. So one of the, the needs, one of one of the, the ways that you really need to make sure that undetectable equals untransmissible. So undetect, undetectable means that you are lower than detectable level. So that means that you do a viral load and, and the person is less than 50 copies. So if that person is less than 50 copies, they, they are not likely to transmit um, the virus to their partners. But for this person who is lower than detectable uh, levels, you have to make sure that they are adherent on their medication and they don't have anything that would stop them from ensuring that they are adherent. So that, I hope that elaborates a detectable equals untransmissible. So basically what we are saying is if people living with HIV take their medication the way they should um, and they are lower than detectable levels because that is actually what the goal of ART is, then there are lower chances of uh, transmission to other people who are not living with HIV. I think, so my wife is HIV positive and I'm still testing negative. I'm using PrEP while she's using her medication. We only have sex on Sunday because she works in Kisumu while I work in Eldoret and we only travel home on Saturday and make love on Sunday before going back to our workplaces. So is there a need for me to continue with my PrEP? And I think when they say they are PrEP, they mean they are oral daily PrEP. Is there any risk when I stop PrEP now? I think they qualify for the event driven. They are saying if, if they're having sex every week. Every week once. They, they call once, they qualify for oral daily PrEP. So I uh, also it will depend on if your partner is suppressed or not. So if your partner is not virus suppressed, you don't qualify for the event driven because it will be very frequent. That's like we're taking it four times in a in a month. Mm -hmm. So you qualify for the daily oral prep. So he asks, um, so is there any need of me to continue with my prep as long as his wife is not virally suppressed? So as long as your, your partner is not virally suppressed, there's need to continue with prep. Mm -hmm. 
So he's asking, is there any risk when I stop prep now? Yes, there is a risk because you have said your partner is not virally suppressed. Alternatively, um, you could make use of a condom and, and uh, consistently use the, the condom correctly. Mm. Okay, there's a question that comes. I came across a client who tested positive in 2015 after some time on being on medication, he tests negative and now he's not using any drug. Now this guy has a wife and children and the wife is negative. This guy also has a girlfriend, three months pregnant, tested negative last month and this month. What is your advice to this girlfriend since she's in great worry? So this is would, would be the other partner. So this man has uh, so this man has a wife and this man tested positive in 2015. And then he says that after some time being on medication, he tested negative. So I'll answer that part in, in saying that probably what happened for this man is that he had very low reservoirs of, of HIV. So when he started treatment, um, that's the only reason why he would test. Okay, that's one of the reasons why he would test negative after a while of being on ART that was started early and he had low HIV reservoirs. So it could be that this man is not really negative, but if he stops hard for some time, uh, some time and he does a test, he will actually find that he's positive. So now let's go on to, he has a wife who is negative and then he also has a girlfriend. So the girlfriend is wondering whether she needs to take PrEP. Um, for the girlfriend, for as long as the man is negative, she does not need to take PrEP um, unless the, the man is engaging in behaviors that are actually putting you at risk. So if the girlfriend confirms that the, the, the man uh, is having sex with other people other than the wife who is HIV negative, then the girlfriend needs to be on PrEP because the man is putting her at risk. I also want to contribute uh, a bit, a little bit regarding the person who was HIV positive in 2015. I have a concern. There are many things could have happened also uh, with the testing processes. Um, I remember the reason why we started um, retest before uh, we actually start somebody on, on AFT. We had incidences actually, and actually we have seen quite a number in the media whereby somebody is suing, I wasn't actually positive. So we may not know what transpired with the, with the test. And that's why these days we have very strict testing algorithms uh, that we adhere to. So this plan may not even have been positive in the first place in 2015, depending on how the test was done. Uh, we are not sure. Uh, so we cannot say for sure he was actually um, um, uh, HIV positive in 2015. And because of such incidences whereby we used to get false positives, uh, back then we were not doing retests. So these days we are actually doing retests. This person is taken through the same process uh, that was done at the VCT uh, point. And uh, at the point of care, the patient is taken through the same process and tested with both kits. And um, I guess also in 2015, we were still using violin and violin we know was removed because of uh, inconsistencies. So let me not um, say for sure this person may have been negative in 2015. I do not want to bank on that point that he was negative in 2015. I want to believe he was negative even at that particular time, uh, even though he may have been, been put on air. At least. So someone asks, what's the rationale for revising down the days from 28 to 7 since last exposure when this continued? I think through, um, through ongoing researches, uh, they have found out just the same way um, you need seven days for you to start working. It's the same way now they have discovered that you actually need only seven days for you to be put on, 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 on prep when you are clearing the prep, uh, when you're stopping the prep. Okay, someone says, so what proportion of PrEP clients whose PrEP use was stopped because partner was virally suppressed have seroconverted? So I think As I had said in my presentation, we have not had a case whereby somebody has seroconverted on the, while they are on PrEP. So that the case scenario I gave is, is because this person had already stopped uh, taking PrEP, their partner was virally suppressed, and they actually contracted the virus from the extra, uh, extra partners they had outside their relationship. So we don't have a percentage uh, from the CCC 
uh, of stroke conversion. Because they are none. Yes. So someone says, nice presentation. After the stakeholders meeting last month, where we concluded what to achieve, that to achieve um, universal health care, all care providers, irrespective of cadres, have to work together. What are the qualifications for having PrEP and PEP in a community pharmacy? Considering that a registered community pharmacy is the first stop public health point, even during emergencies, are there trainings that one can attend to qualify? My pharmacy is a hub of activities, most of which are voluntary. Kindly advise me on how I can be part of the fight. I love offering a service even at no cost. So, I mean, I think we'd need a pharmacist here, but I think one of the things would be, would one of the challenges of doing that in a community pharmacy is always commodities. And really, how would you be able to report um, who you've given the drugs to and how many are still on follow-up for, you know, for PrEP, for HIV prevention? So I think that would be one of the challenges that I think needs to be ironed out first before you can think about having them in the community pharmacy. Regarding the trainings for PrEP, um, training for PrEP, we, for example, I'm a nurse, and um, I have attended trainings that have been offered through NASCOP. Uh, that's why and how I am able to offer uh, PrEP services. So my training was through NASCOP. Okay, so the NASCOP trainings, I think if you look um, in the, in the, what, in the like, site. Yes, Nelson, are we, are we done? No, <laughs> Hello, this is Anzala. Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, yes. I just want to, to pose a comment and maybe hear what you guys have to say. Uh, this is great. Can I go on? Yes, you can. But There's maybe Nelson in the, in the background, you can just mute. Okay. Yeah this, yeah, this is great, great, great information. And uh, here at Kavi, at the University of Nairobi, where I am, we are still yes. looking for an HIV vaccine. But in, in the view of uh, all these multipurpose preventive technologies, working very, very well. I just want to pose a, 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 a debate and ask uh, you guys, do you think that with the current uh, preventive technologies that we have, we are able uh, to end the HIV pandemic without an HIV vaccine? Oh, let me just, I, I think let me just talk about it because I think the answer is no. I think with HIV, there's so much more that we are fighting that's not biological. There's stigma that we are fighting. With stigma, there's no testing. There's no HIV testing going on. So for you to prevent, um, uh, to prevent HIV infection, I think it has to be multi-pronged. And I think we need everything that we can get to fight um, HIV prevention. And a vaccine would be welcome because it, it would be more acceptable than all these measures that we're using. Yes, we can decentralize PrEP, but how acceptable would it be to most people? You know, vaccines that are within the national vaccine schedule, you know, nobody says, why do I have to get this PCG? And we still have people that are, have vaccine hesitancy, but once it's in the national schedule, you reduce the stigma. I don't know, what's your take, Jerusha? I think I agree, I tend to agree. Uh, because one, once we get the vaccine, remember when you, we are taking the, the daily oral pill, we still have this burden of adherence and people tend to forget, people tend, to, in Nairobi people are so busy, some don't show up for their, for their appointments, so they tend to miss on the, on the PrEP. So if we can have the vaccine, I'm thinking um, uh, people will, will not be having problems probably of storage of their medication. Some people fear to take PrEP home because it actually looks like an ARV. So they'll be branded uh, like people who are already taking ARVs. So with the vaccine, you're preventing all, all these things like maybe stigma, showing up at a CCC for, for your PrEP and uh, adher poor adherence, making people not adhere to their drugs and which may lead to a seroconversion. So for me, I think a vaccine will do. 
Yes, yeah, so I think that's from us, uh, Prof. What What would you say? <laughs> no, thank you. You, you see, we, we, we are still at it 30 years down the line. HIV has proved to be a, a, a virus that we can't be, we, we can't believe that we don't have a vaccine for HIV. I always am telling people now, for those who like Premier League, that HIV is in its own Premier League compared to other viruses, even in comparing to Ebola, Marburg, COVID and the like. So we must keep this debate that uh, we, we still need an HIV vaccine to end, uh, to end this outbreak. Maybe in the coming weeks, if there is a room, I could uh, also talk of what, where we are with, uh, in terms of vaccine, HIV vaccine discovery and what our challenges and what do we see. But be before I end, there, is, there was an issue of um, uh, where you are saying that uh, there are tests that are not covered, like creatinine, hepatitis uh, B surface antigen, hepatitis C. But my one, my one is if some of these patients are on NHIF, and NHIF be for this test, or is it a, a discussion that we should be having? Over. So I think I think we still need to to drive the UHC agenda, and I think one way would be through NHIF. But unfortunately, in in, in our hospital, KNH, you cannot access those tests um, using the NHIF cover. You still have to pay out of pocket for them. So if there's a way we could make the NHIF also serve our patients in terms of covering some of those tests. I think it would really help. So I think this, this is up to the policy makers to really just look for ways of increasing access to, to these tests. Not only for those who are using PrEP for HIV prevention, but also those who are using ART for HIV treatment. But you know the noise must come from us, eh? Yes. <laughs> We must shout very hard because definitely it is necessary that if I'm actually paying for NHIF, that this test should actually be cut on the cover. So we must begin to make that noise. Yeah, so that make, we, yes, yes, help us, join us in making the noise. So we, this, this is a take home, but we will definitely. If you know any forum where you think I can make noise, get it. All right. <laughs> Get in touch. Okay, thank you very much. I've seen our time has come to an end. Um, thank you so much uh, for attending. Thank you so much for your participation. We were not able to answer every question in the chat, um, but if you have any clarifications you, you'd want to seek, you can just come to the can hit CCC and we'll take you through what you didn't understand. So thank you. And that's over from me. Thank you everyone for listening in. Over. Yes. And uh, this is uh, Janet Handa from uh, representing Gilead. Thank you very much, Jerusha and uh, Dr. Kamau for such a wonderful presentation, uh, for sharing your years of uh, experience. And uh, this has been very, very good. And uh, we as Gilead are here to support and work together with you because we also want to see that, you know, what you're doing is, um, you know, excellent and great and for our patients. So thank you all. And thank you to KNH uh, research team for this session. And, uh, you know, the gurus in HIV, Professor Nzala and the rest of the team. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon. Bye. Thank you so much, Janet. Thank you for your support. Thanks and over.